Hi, I'm Chef Dennis, and welcome to Around the Kitchen Table. My co-host Susan Sarah is here, and we've got some deliciousness headed your way. And uh, we, we've, you'll notice we've cut the show down to a half an hour because, you know, it was getting a little hard for people to stay on for a full hour. So we're going to condense it a little bit today, and I hope you bear with us while we uh, work this out to a, a shorter format. So how you doing, Susan? I'm doing just great. Just great. I, I, I think the new format's going to be cool. I think we're going to just give bullet points of, uh, you know, good cooking tips and smart kitchen design tips, and I think it's going to be uh, better than ever. So I'm, I'm doing great. And look at you. I am crazy about that color. Now, that is a color that I can, you know, get on board with, and I want everyone to say, what do they think of this new chef's coat? I, I think it's you know. cool. You're looking good. You've been holding out on this one. Uh, well, they, the two came together, and I sprung the plum on you last week. Yeah. Uh, and this is a really good color. I love this color blue. It's kind of like a teal almost. It has always been one of my favorite blues. Uh, it's like a peacock blue, and you are strutting yourself <laughs> like a peacock. I, yeah. think it's, I think it's great. That's good. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we have a... Cool show today, one of my favorite, and you know, this is, don't you think this is kind of a fish that's kind of easy to like? I, I think so, you know, and it's something, so we don't always go out and get scallops, you know, if we're in a restaurant, that's one of the things I always look for in a menu, you know, I might not just get plain scallops, but I'll make sure I get something that has scallops with it, because, you know, while we might cook shrimp at home, we'll cook fish at home, uh, even clams, we rarely rarely do scallops and you know and they're really a, a very tasty uh, I don't know uh, shellfish I guess because they come from yeah. the shell. Uh, one of the things on here too we were talking about earlier is most of the time there's a little bit of a muscle here that you want to make sure you pull off whenever you cook scallops too because it's too tough and you don't want to eat that and that's where it connects to the shell and all those pretty little shells that you always see on the beach with the scalloped edges well that's where they come from from scallops so. yeah I know I know I love to I love to collect those uh, shells now do you up here where I am on Long Island we also have the, the very tiny scallops and I can't remember which is bay and which are sea, sea scallops think of the bigger body of water the bay scallops are small the sea scallops okay. are the big ones. There you go. That's it forever until the day I die. That yep. is, I'm going to remember that. Cool. That's and, how and isn't there a difference in the um, the taste? I think so. I don't. I don't think the bay scallops really have uh, as pronounced a flavor. And, and you know they're always overcooked because they're so small. Generally, you put them in sauces or soups, and so they're getting you know really cooked way way too long. Um, it's not something you'll find too many sautéed dishes or anything that's going to be treated well. You know, because again, they're so small, it's hard to cook them properly. Um, I, I would, I might try and bread them and deep fry them and just do some tiny little sea scallop fried oh. sea scallops. But you know, and, and do them really, really quickly uh, just to get some color on them. Cool. Uh, I, I like that. Great idea. And and after, I'll be talking about where to store these pans and which can really be a pain in the neck and there's so many options which I'm going to share with you so chef let's get started with your terrific dish once again okay. sounds good and uh, first thing we're going to talk about really is about the scallops and preparing them now, I first mentioned about taking the muscle off of them which is important to do but you want to find a nice size scallops sometimes if they get a little bit too big they're, they're going to take too long to cook they're going to be hard to handle and it's not really, you know, size is not as, as important when they get some really like under eight size they used to sell. I, I don't want them quite that big. This is probably about a 16 or 20 count, somewhere in that range. And that's a nice size for a scallop. And actually these were previously frozen. These aren't fresh scallops. And I got these at, um, I think it was Sam's Club. And they've really been very, very good. This is actually the last one I have. So I have some shrimp on the side to uh, supplement this dinner with tonight so we have enough to eat. But first thing you do after you wash your scallops, you pull the little muscle off, is you dry them really, really well. Now I've had these in a few layers of paper towels. Let them soak all the moisture out of them, especially when you're going to sear them because they want to be really, really dry to sear. And so from that point on, I patted them down. I've got them nice and dry. And we're going to season them. Now typically, to get a crust on the scallop, 
you want to let it caramelize a little bit. And I've got my pan on getting hot because the most important thing right now is a very hot pan. And that's really what's going to determine the searing of the scallop, getting a nice uh, color to it, a little bit of a crust to it, and not overcooking the scallop. And that's the most important thing. If it takes you too long to sear that scallop, you're going to ruin the scallop. You're going to overcook it. It's going to be rubbery and it's not going to have that really great flavor that you're looking for. So while the pan's heating up, I'm just going to season these. Typically it's just salt and pepper. I mean if that's all you want to do, you know, put some nice uh, salt, you know, brown salt on it, sea salt on it, and some fresh crack, uh, cracked pepper, both sides, and you're in business. But I'm going to do a little Old Bay today. I know I had a Cajun seasoning. Oh, yes. Isn't that, isn't that so great? That's, it, it just does it all. We really like Old Bay and any excuse to use it. Now, I'm just going to pat it into it a little bit before I turn them over. Because I don't want them to be over seasoned, but I want them to have some nice flavor. My pan is getting hot. I can smell it. Now, did you put um, any oil in the pan yet? Not yet. I'm going to let it get okay. hot first because okay. if I put the oil in now, as it heats really quickly, as it gets hot, it's going to start to smoke. And I'm just trying to cut down on that a little bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's another important thing about cooking scallops is you can use all kinds of oils. This is not one of the times that I'm going to be using olive oil. And I'm going to be using a vegetable oil. for Actually, it's canola oil because canola oil has a higher heating point. Oh, olive that's oil. why I see that so often. I, I, I don't have it. I really should get it. Well, I use this for baking because I don't want always want that flavor of olive oil in baking. And if I need something for higher heat, I also have some coconut oil in the house, and that's really got a, a higher heat to it. So I could have used that. Uh, but I had the canola oil goes up to about 420 degrees okay. in that range. And olive oil is more at the 350 range, somewhere around that, maybe even a little lower. Okay, let, let me ask you a question. I'm always a fan of mixing oil and butter because of the flavor. Is that something that you would do with scallops? You could. You're not really going to taste it. You taste whatever's at the end. So, I mean, uh, and if you use butter, it'd have to be clarified butter. Okay. Oh, really? Oh, because it's so, because you're searing. Yeah, and butter's got, got a lower smoke point too. Butter's a fat. You wouldn't use yeah. any kind of a, uh, that type of a fat. Um, animal, more of a vegetable fat is what you're looking for. Good, that, good point. Good point. Oh, I love that. I love that sound. Who doesn't love that? That sound. <laughs> And you probably don't want them to touch, right? No. Isn't that like a common thing? Or else what what will happen? They'll steam? Well, it's not so much as they'll just start to stick. And yeah, they'll steam a little bit. And this is also, too, is overcrowding. And a lot of times people try to put way too much in a pan. Because what happens is, is the temperature of the pan is going to go down as you put a lot of more product in it. So we're going to be... I'm adding them slowly. And so that's a very that's a very high heat. Yes. Yeah, I have I actually have this turned up on seven, but I've okay. never had it past five. So it might have even been able to go up a little bit more. I'll crank it up to eight. I just don't want it to smoke. Uh, you want to be careful that it doesn't smoke too much. Uh, if it's starting to smoke a lot, you know, then that's about the time that you want to turn it off or turn it down. How, how can you tell, uh, Chef, if the scallops are fresh? I mean, you know, but I, there's a couple of fish markets in, in my town, and one, one, one time when I brought the salmon home, it just smelled a tiny bit fishy, and it didn't in the other place. Uh, so now I'm shopping in the other place. It, how can you tell? Is it the odor? Is there any way other than the well, it, odor, or that's what you go by? It's the flesh. The flesh should be firm. If it starts to okay. give a little too much when you push on it, you know, it's older. It's like anything else. If it's a fresh fish, if it's a whole fish, look at the eyes to see how cloudy the eyes are. See how the scales are on it. 
you know, there's just certain ways to look at it. And if it has, it should smell like the sea. Once it starts to smell like fish, it's begun that journey into being old. Okay. Uh, you just have a, like, it's, it's okay to have a smell like the sea, but you don't want it to have a real fishy smell. All right, these are looking good. And it's important, you want, like I said, you want to get some color on them. A lot of people will use non-stick pans. I've just, you know, I have one for eggs, but I rarely use a Teflon pan for anything else. I've never been a big fan of Teflon. Uh, yeah, I was, you know, I was wondering about that. In fact, I have a pan. I think it's stainless steel. It just seems like everything always sticks to it. I wonder if it's oh, yeah. because I don't um, cook with as high a heat as I should be. Is that why? The high, the high heat will definitely help, but then you just have to get under it. Now you can see I got some real good color on a few of these. And the ones that broke up, you know, I normally, I'm, I'm using them because I'm not going to throw scallops away. Um, of course. But presented wise, I would present the prettier ones. So, you know, this is pretty much it. And, you know, we were talking about how to, these were frozen. So you want to, like I said, like to frost them in cold running water. Or you can put them in your refrigerator and let them defrost overnight. And then after you rinse them off, you just want to make sure you towel them down and get them nice and dry. Anytime you're going to cook something, even shrimp, if it was frozen. You know, dry them off really well first so you don't have any excess moisture. So this is pretty much done. And it, it's just kind of like anything else. It'll start to feel a little firmer as it's cooked. But a scallop, you know, pretty much you want to cook them. You want to get some color on each side. Let's see how this other side looks. Yeah, but how do you really know that's done? I mean... How do you know, is there how many minutes you cook it, or what if it's translucent inside? I mean, you don't want to cut into it. No, so would you, you say about two minutes per side? Two minutes per side would be the most I would go. But again, you want to look at the size of them. Like these were about maybe, oh, about two minutes a side. But you want to check on the size, and then you want to get a good color. And then the feel. Like I said, it'll start to firm up. And when it firms up, you're pretty much done. If you're not sure, mm -hmm. you can flash them in a hot oven. You, know, you can put them in a 350-degree oven for about five to seven minutes just to make sure, you know, as soon as you took them off the stove. Uh, if you wanted to hold these for a little while, get your searing done, uh, you could also do the same thing when you're ready to serve. It's just flash them in a real hot oven because they don't have to be steaming hot. You know, it's kind of like a filet. You know, filet is never served really, really hot, hot. But, you know, the same thing with scallops. Don't expect them to be steaming hot. They should be hot. But, you yeah, know, but, but they have to be cooked through. It's not like salmon absolutely. there. I like medium rare salmon. Mm -hmm. So scallops have to be totally cooked through like shrimp, right? Yeah, you want them cooked through. But they don't take quite as long as you might think. Okay, cool. And they can so, be just a, just a tad, not quite, you know, just really close. It's, it's just a hard... All on, any, on something that's just delicate, and it's a matter of cooking it long enough to you kind of get the feel of it. But you know, when in doubt, cook it just a little bit longer. Cool. Okay. So, what else do you have uh, going for us there? We're. Uh, I'm, I'm going to clean this pan out a little bit, and then I'm going to come back with uh, what I'm going to serve with it, my accompaniment. So, if you want to talk sure. to our, I'll sure. take over from here. You got so, it. okay. Cool. So we have to store these pans, and I don't know about you, but I have a really dysfunctional kitchen. Um, I moved into this house, uh, my husband and I did about five years ago, five and a half years ago. We still have not done the kitchen, and the kitchen is um, uh, basic, typical kitchen cabinets, and we don't, in the in some of the cabinets, we don't have any <clears throat> uh, storage aids, per se. So. I put together an, uh, an album of uh, different ways to store pans and some pots too and I'd like to show that to you. So I'm going to quickly go into screen share. Here we are 
And now here is the first kitchen. This is actually a kitchen that I designed. And you can see now what's over the island is it's an antique meat rack that a, um, uh, a colleague of mine who owns the kitchen went to seek after, to look after something fabulous and antique and, and you know, isn't that great? Here's another pot rack. So, of course, we're all familiar with storing pots and pans on a pot rack. And let me tell you, there are so many wonderful ways, uh, you know, which can really be a focal point over an island, as you see, on walls, uh, you know, so many different ways. Now, one thing that I, I really is important to me is you see rollouts here. This is interesting because it's angled back. But what I like about this is what's important when storing pots and pans is not to overload. Just, I mean, you see, oh, but only put two, only put, yes, put less pots and pans if you can because then you'll have less clanking. Of course, the one you always want is on the bottom. So th those are a couple of suggestions. Here are typical rollout shelves. This, uh, this actually is attached all in one. You attach a door to it and you pull out the whole door and you access them from the sides. Now here, um, I was at a kitchen show and there's all kinds of storage aids. Uh, the one I just showed, corner solutions, regular rollouts, and uh, there are so many storage aids, which is good for universal design. It's good for your bad back. Now, here's a great one that I really like. I believe this may be by, possibly by Revashelf. And you can store pans vertically, vertically, which is cool. So you have the handles. Um, up and these types of inserts you can retrofit into any of your base cabinets uh, so it'll prevent you from digging and here's another one you'll notice the door right in front and we have uh, now this is interesting and I've seen this too a, a sort of pegboard now this one is is high but you can do it on a lower cabinet too I think Revashelf makes that pegboard board type of um, uh, base cabinet insert too. So that's really cool and there they are, very accessible. Here's another kitchen I designed and what I did, it's kind of a French French country look. Below the cooktop there is uh, two doors that have chicken wire. Chicken wire and then you can see the pans inside to kind of give it that little you know casual country feel. Here's another kitchen I designed where we have pots hanging on each side of the uh, mantel hood on each side of the range. So this is a pot rack that's just horizontal, close to the wall, and you can use it for decorative or functional pots. Another, I mean, this is this is kind of a luxury chrome rollout type shelf, uh, and also other closer um, storage solutions. Here we have it in green, but that's actually the lighting. Now you can also uh, outfit a very shallow pantry. Notice that this is shallow. We don't have pans hanging on here, but you can see the S hooks uh, right over here. So we can certainly uh, add that and add some hanging pans somewhat nearby and, and a good accessible height as well. Again, now we have, although we have cookie sheets here, we can certainly put in the cast iron pants, any kind of pants in a vertical way, um, one by one or two by two, separated by these vertical dividers. It's a different solution you don't normally see. Another solution, a sliding door and then a uh, rollout. And here's just a bunch of different uh, types of uh, storage solutions. Now here's one that's in a corner. It's in uh, part of an L-shaped corner. So that's cool. And you can just put, again, you can fit three or four or five pans on here and maybe maybe stack one or two, maybe two. I'm not so sure I'd stack three because then it's a lot of banging and, you know, uh, what goes where. So here's another view of that vertical one. And also, they, there are these um, inserts you can put in a drawer. Now, that's in a drawer. So, and here's a base cabinet uh, pegboard configuration. A great uh, view of how to store pans. Easy, pick it up, take it out. Each one has a home. 
another interesting configuration rollouts now look at this this is these are small pans but this is an old-fashioned pantry uh, you know painted a bright color with a pegboard again like Julia Child used so that's my uh, little album of uh, pegboards so pretty cool huh not pegboards I mean storage solutions for pans cool those huh great I love some of those ideas and here uh, Aslan Bloor has just commented that she'll she loves your work and she's gonna fly you there when they remodel oh cool I'm there I'm totally there feed me feed me and I'm there she feed me <laughs> alright so I'm get started with the accompaniment now and I've got my pan hot I just put a little oil in it and I'm dumping in my corn because that's going to take the longest to cook right now and actually it doesn't take very long at all so we just want to sear it up a little bit and now I'm going to put some salt and pepper on it now I wonder if that will give you sort of a flavor almost like a like grilled corn you know sort of browning a little browning it a little bit what do you think well you know you want, again you want to do it at a high temperature so you get a little caramelization to it so you know I had my pan nice and hot and I'm just gonna get a little you know little color you can see a couple of the kernels turning brown in there and as I'm doing that I'm gonna add a little bit of red pepper the color so that I, I think that seems uh, to that it will probably be probably enhance the flavor the, of sauteing the corn like that Oh, absolutely. It gives, okay. It's going to give it a little more sweetness because you're going to caramelize it a little bit with that high temperature. Yep. And, you know, your corn is, is really doesn't take a long, long time to cook. We tend to overcook corn a lot, especially when we boil it, if we grill it. You know, and, and some of the sweetest corn I had has been the corn that I grilled. And just, you know, it's real crunchy still. You, know, you just don't want it to be raw. And this is pretty good right here. We didn't get a lot of color to it, but it's cooking up nicely. A little bit more pepper on so this. So do you do you par cook the peppers at all? Well, they were roasted peppers. Oh, they were roasted peppers. Oh, I love roasted peppers. Because I had roasted peppers in the house I wanted to use up. But if they were fresh peppers, no, I wouldn't. I would put them in, and they're going to get, they're still going to be a little crispy, but they're going to be nice and tasty, and they're going to be bright. And you know they're going to retain their flavor, so that's pretty much done. So now I also am going to add a little rice to this, and this happened because I had some leftover rice, so I actually had to make it for this dish. But when I first came up with this idea, it came together because I was using some things I had left over in the house, which is you know a lot of times how you come up with some tasty dishes. It sure is. Isn't so that's done. That is clever. All right, I'm going to turn the heat off. I'm going to add in some peaches. Wow. Oh, love it and love, love. See, you know what I love about a lot of your dishes is the visual and the texture, the, the colors, the texture. It's a beautiful visual. And you know what? That, that makes food so uh, enjoyable also yep. for me anyway. Little cilantro. Has to look good. Has to look good. Yeah, it's got to look good, and it's got some nice fresh flavors here. And you saw how fast that was to make. Now, all right, if you don't have time to get fresh corn and take it off the ears, buy some frozen corn. There's some really good frozen corn out there, you know, and uh, try that up. And again, you know, it's it's not always about spending a lot of time making a dish if you don't have the time to prep it but you can blend things together if you've got some leftover pasta this could have just as easily been some like little pasta shapes instead of the rice and it would have still been wonderful I think that looks great chef I think it looks like an easy light dish summer you know it, it really says a lot about summer I think it's a oh. beautiful dish yeah, and this side dish alone, even if you don't feel like making scallops, this would go great with some grilled chicken. Oh, yeah. Yeah, in fact, that's what I'm making tomorrow. Well, I'm not making grilled chicken. I'm making my bistro chicken with the garlic and the tarragon and the wine and everything. But, uh, yeah, this looks really great. Wow. Beautiful. We have a few comments. Yeah, let's see. Uh, the other way. Yeah, okay. Stop there. Nice. Nice. 
uh, crust on it. Nice brown, nice color, the red. But you know what? You're, you're an artist. You're a visual artist as well as a food artist. Thank you. Love it. Love it. Okay. So that, so, you know, so if you had a few more scallops, like I said, if you wanted to make this with chicken, that would be really, really good with chicken. You'd have some wonderful flavors going there. Yeah, I mean, I can even see, um, and how about a one-dish meal with andouille sausage? Sure. You could throw some more, you know, you could have your, you know, your the other protein and just add it right in. It's cooked, add it in at the end. The only thing you want to be careful of is like when you add fruit is you don't want to oh, cook true. it. You don't want to cook it too much. So if you're adding in something like that, you'll notice I pretty much had the heat off when I added the, the peaches into it because I want them to retain their integrity. I'm not going to give them an opportunity to really caramelize because I have so much else in the pan now, so they'll more like, more like steam and just soften up. Yeah. So that's not what I'm looking for. So, you know, I, I got it nice and hot. I added my ingredients together, turned it off, add the peaches in just to get them a little toss with the heat. Right. You want them to retain their fresh, yes. uh, you know, temperature and taste. Absolutely. Yeah, smart. Now, we have a few uh, comments. Sure. Okay, so um, Christopher Vogelman says, uh, where are we? Okay, so any danger of undercooking scallops? I think he's talking in terms of danger. Any? But that, it's a good question. Uh, you know, I tend to undercook mine just a little. I've never had an issue with it. Um, you know, they're like uh, Aslan said, they do make sushi out of scallops. It's just you always have to make sure your seafood is of a good source. And I think it comes down to that as like finding a fishmonger that you trust. You know, a lot of things now are flash frozen right on the ship, and that really preserves the integrity of the products a lot more than bringing them into the into uh, the harbor, you know, and transferring them and all that. So sometimes frozen is good because of that reason. Um, and it's safer. But, you know, if you can find a good fishmonger, like there is nothing better than good fresh scallops if you can find them. And they should be a dry pack. Like when I used to buy them by the 40-pound bag, I mean, there was no moisture in that bag at all. They were dry, really dry. Oh, so, that's great. That's exactly that's exactly what you need. And Coach G. Moore says, fish add lemon juice for older missold quotes fish. Yeah, I'm not. Sh I'm not sure what he means by that. Do you know? Well, he said the, the lemon juice will help mask some of the this, this odor, and uh, you just really need to shop where the fish is a little fresher. Absolutely. Yeah, so we no were, question we were, about uh, that. Our local grocer and my wife was in the mood for fish, and she's pointing at it, and I go, "You don't want that." No. You really don't want that. Good thing she didn't. She was without you and didn't bring it home. Well, so you know, that is what people do, you know, unfortunately. Another one from Coach G. Moore, uh, is the pan all-clad? No, it's not an all-clad, Coach, but an all-clad would work. It's, you need a, a pan that is induction ready, and my pan is actually a duck's top, which I had never heard of in my life, huh. and it is amazing. They don't make every pan. I would order more, more of them. They have some small sets, but it's heavy. It cooks really well on induction. It cleans up well. The, the saute pan, I think, was like $30. And, you know, compared to an all-clad, which all-clad is brilliant, would have been probably $100 for the same saute pan. Uh, but, yeah, the, I, you know, I don't have, we, we need all-clad to send me some pans. <laughs> definitely, definitely. There's a lot to do on, on those. And Loretta Sebas. Gianni says, very interesting recipe, quick to do. And that's really your hallmark. That's that's a big part of it anyway, don't you think? Yeah, it's got to be something that you can do quickly. Uh, it's not going to really take all your time to do it. Because really, if you're, if you're working and you're tired, nothing's better than having a really good, interesting meal to eat at the end of that day to cheer you up because food really changes your mood. But if you, if it's going to require so much work that it's just you're going to be more aggravated than happy about it, you know, you, you've lost it. So my dishes tend to be quick. Saute is wonderful for that. 
uh, thinking about using things that you have on hand. You know, like if you had plums on hand, you could have put some plums in there, chopped plums, cherries. Cherries would have been really nice in there. Believe it or not, you know, people are, might be shaking their heads, but try, you know, some fresh cherries halved in there with your corn. Match things. You know, use your imagination. And you'll be really surprised. Yeah, and I can tell you too to enhance the whole exp cooking experience. Don't over stock your cabinets and keep them easily accessible because when you can quickly reach for this or that and lids, you saw how lids were stored vertically. You may have missed that shot. Um, oh, I saw it. Yeah, okay. So, you know, when you're when you just can reach for things easily and quickly, I mean, doesn't that just enhance the whole experience? It's, yeah, it's the whole thing. It's the whole idea of easy, happy cooking, using what you have. But again, you know, stocking your dry pantry with some things that, you know, maybe will cross blend, lend themselves to making different dishes, you know, some different kinds of pastas, just to change up things. But, uh, you know, as you go along, you just add another spice, add something, but, you know, enjoy what you're doing, but make it. Yeah, and and to me too, things that are made quicker are always really flavorful and fresh. That's how I think of them. So you know, that's another way to think about it too. And yeah, and and this this is a good uh, dish to uh, show those points. So thanks again, uh, everyone, for watching. And chef, it was great fun. Good show. Always is, and thank you so much for coming, and here's our newer, shorter, improved version of Around the Kitchen Table. We'll see you all next time.